right, and with that, uh, we'll begin. Thank you. I'm filling in for Dr. Target, who is ill today. Our best wishes for him, but uh, he was traveling, and, and we were just talking about traveling and conferences are places where you pick up uh, pick up these uh, vectors. So, uh, so um, I just misplaced my glasses, but I don't need them. Uh, <laughs> Uh, our, our guest is Dr. Frances Hellman. I uh, was uh, very pleased that she uh, uh, decided to come. I had offered her um, in previous semesters, and the time worked out for her to come this semester. And uh, she is um, the Dean of Mathematical and Physical Sciences at UC Berkeley. Uh, yes, exactly. So um, it's. Um, and I was talking to the, some of the students who take this course for credit, the physics majors, and uh, they were talking about her, her resume being quite impressive, saying, there's so many papers there, I don't know where to look. Um, but her group is very active in material science and condensed matter physics. In fact, I think we're hearing about lab on a chip today. So, very good. Um, she has her bachelor's in physics from Dartmouth and her PhD from Stanford University. She's a fellow of the uh, American Physical Society. Uh, and uh, she, run, as I said, she's the dean and she runs this large research group out of UC Berkeley. We're just so fortunate to have her. Let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Frances Hellman. Well, it's a great, it's a, can you all hear me in the back? Or if you at some point can't, just stick your hand up and I'll talk louder. So it's a great pleasure to be here and thank you for inviting me. So I'm glad to have, to have made it. And I have a cell phone that is not mine, so is that? That's, that's mine. That's it's not to, not, <laughs> not to tell you to go fast. Oh. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to be telling you today about, indeed I am a material, I would call myself a materials physicist. And in fact, um, just out of interest, um, I'm actually a member of the physics department. I'm also in the materials, material science and engineering department, and I'm a member of uh, Lawrence Berkeley Labs material sciences division. Um, and so the one of the, since I believe I'm talking to a fair number of undergraduates, just point out that one of the interesting things about my area of research is it sort of lies, I could be doing research equally well in the chemistry department, in the physics department, material science, even electrical engineering. In fact, when I was originally interviewing for assistant professor positions, I in fact interviewed in all of those departments. Um, I chose the physics department because I love teaching physics. So the research can really cross any of those areas, but you know, I love teaching physics, and so that's where I ended up. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about today is that any of you, I don't know how many of you have ever taken a condensed matter physics class. Anybody taking a condensed matter physics class? Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, if you did, what you would find is that virtually every textbook starts with the crystalline structure, and I show you an, an example of this, as though all materials were crystalline. And so it starts by, um, starts from that framework, and within that framework there are very well-developed theories to explain how things are metals, how they're semiconductors, how they're insulators, superconductors, what a defect is, you can sort of imagine if I have a crystal structure like that, if you, you, know, you take an atom out or you put an extra atom in, it's very easy to describe what the defects look like. They're grain grains, which are basically little tiny crystals. And every condensed matter physics textbook starts from that standpoint. So condensed matter physics ends up being entirely described in terms of symmetries and a perfectly periodic lattice. And literally, all of the theories for all of these properties is based on that perfectly periodic lattice with all these, all, the, all these symmetries to draw on. But the interesting thing is I'm just showing here a sort of what looks like a generic blobby mess. And I will talk a lot more about what that generic blobby mess looks like. But let's just for the moment draw a bunch of sort of random looking spheres. And the point of this, it's disordered, which means a bunch of things, but among other things that it means there is no long range order, which means that if I know where like one atom is, if I go x distance away, I have no idea whether I have an atom there or not. But it's not enough to say that you don't have long range order, because in fact, if I had a whole bunch of little tiny crystals jammed together, I would also not have long range order. So how, knowing where one atom was in one crystal, I would have no idea where, where another atom might lie over here. So it's really not enough to just say no long range order. There's a lot of other things you have to say in order to describe an amorphous material. One of the things that it is not 
is a continuously connected structure from there. So that's another thing that many people sort of have an idea. It, it's sometimes hard to distinguish between tiny materials with tiny little crystals in them and a material that is amorphous. But it is not a continuous function. You don't go, you don't start taking a perfect crystal and then add in defects and eventually get to this. In fact, what you would find is much more interesting. If you take a structure like this and start gradually adding in defects, maybe by damaging it, by you know, bombarding it, for example, what you will find is at some point you'll have added so much energy to this crystalline structure that it will actually transform discontinuously to a lower energy state, which is that. So it is not a continuous transition from a more and more disordered crystalline state. No more so, I'm going to end up describing to you what I'm going to call a perfect um, amorphous material, or an ideal glass will be the words I'll use. And within that ideal glass, although it may be hard to describe where the atoms are, nonetheless, you can say quite a bit about an ideal glass. And I'll draw an analogy to, for example, a gas. Now, in a gas, we don't actually care where all the atoms exactly are. That isn't the point of a gas. We don't need to know where all the atoms are in order to describe the properties of a gas. The same thing with a liquid. There's lots of things we do with liquids, with how they flow, all, all, a whole variety of properties. And we don't need to know where every atom is to describe those properties. So the same thing is sort of true here. So, and the, for the point I want to make is it is hard to describe the structure. It's hard to talk about defects. And even hard to talk about how the electrons move in a metal move around. But there are amorphous metals. There are amorphous insulators. There are amorphous semiconductors. There are amorphous superconductors, ferromagnets, ferrimagnets, etc. So virtually all of the properties that we are trying to describe in condensed matter physics are found just as much in amorphous materials as they are in crystalline materials. And so <clears throat> One of the, um, the example I'd like to focus on just from the beginning, and I, I won't talk about this much more, but it's just such a beautiful example, is amorphous superconductors. So superconductivity, think, so I don't know how much people even know what superconductivity is, but the essence of it is that, that electrons pair up into what we call Cooper pairs. And those Cooper pairs then, um, it's a lower energy state, otherwise it wouldn't happen at all. But once you have those Cooper pairs, the, the electrons can travel through the solid without scattering. Without scattering means without a, you don't have to apply a voltage to get a current to flow. There's no heat dissipation. So the original theory of superconductivity was what's called the BCS theory, after the people who discovered it, Bardeen, Cooper, and Schrieffer. And the original theory, and I'm going to describe this in a sort of classical hand-wavy way, but is one electron is moving through the solid this way. Because it's a negative charge, the positive ions distort in towards it. And that, in turn, since the positive ions move much more slowly, the first electron is long gone. Another electron comes through in the opposite direction. And because it's, it's then attracted to that area of positive charge. So what that does is provide a virtual attraction between the two electrons. And that is, so the superconductivity is described as a virtual transfer of phonons from one electron to the other that gives you a decreased energy. So that description of one traveling this way and one traveling that way, you can't take it too literally because of, they're moving very fast and pretty quickly they'd be very far apart. That's, it's so, that, but nonetheless, that is a qualitative description. But that's not going to work if I have a material in which the electron is scattering at every atom. And the best description of an amorphous metal is that the electrons literally scatter at every, you know, the spacing here is, is um, is one atom apart. So the electrons literally scatter at every atom. So they can't be one going this way and one, one going that way. Yet there are amorphous superconductors. So the generalization of BCS theory is, to me, a rather remarkable one. <clears throat> you don't have to have electron paired like you know, what we call plane waves, one traveling left, one traveling right. The analogy is if you had a, an incredibly complex set of mirrors and one and you shone a laser in, or even a, a light beam in, and it hit a whole bunch of mirrors all in sequence. It could look like a horribly um, complicated path. But wherever it comes out, you could take a, 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 same, a light source from that side and shine it back in, and it would bounce its way all back through and go out the other way. So we call those time reverse states. So the interesting thing about in an amorphous superconductor, the theory had to be generalized to say it wasn't just backward and forward going electrons. It was time reverse states of each other. So that's the mathematics of that. 
the thing that I find sort of more remarkable is superconductivity is what we call an emergent phenomenon. And what do we mean by that? What we mean by that is the condensed matter physics is, a, is on its face a horrendously complicated problem. In every cubic centimeter, there is roughly 10 to the 23rd electrons, 10 to the 23rd positively charged ions. And you know, we can't even really solve four-body four problems in all their you know, full generality. So what in the world are we doing talking about 10 to the 23rd? Indistinguishable particles in a cubic centimeter. And they are indistinguishable. The electrons are moving sufficiently quickly that they're all m immersed with each other. Um, and you have to have a fully Pauli exclusion principle like state where every electron is in its own unique state. So out of that, what sounds like an incredibly messy problem, what the word emergent means is that a pure phenomena arises out of that. So superconductivity is a single wave function. All of the electrons are now in a single wave function. So we don't have to, the, all the complexity is gone and we get a pure state that emerges. So my point here is, isn't it even more remarkable? So superconductivity is already pretty remarkable that something can carry electricity without any energy required. No loss, no friction. There are no classical systems that have not just low friction, but no friction. So it's already an amazing idea, superconductivity. But isn't it even more amazing that electrons can travel through a completely disordered, jumbled mess without ever scattering, than that they travel through a perfectly ordered system without scattering? So the way you have to think about it, the formal words that we tend to use is that superconductivity is robust to disorder. The phenomenon of superconductivity doesn't care whether the system is ordered or disordered. Um, and so um, one of the interesting things that many people don't realize is there are superconductors that have higher uh, superconducting transition temperatures than their crystalline counterpart, molybdenum. So amorphous molybdenum, well, crystalline, crystalline molybdenum is about a one degree superconductor. Amorphous molybdenum is about seven degrees. So I love that generalization. And as an experimentalist, which I am, um, I love the playground of the periodic table, but even more than that, I love the idea that I can force the theorists to generalize their theories. <laughs> that oftentimes the theories get taken, it's fine, we all make approximations, but I love being able to remind them that sometimes the theories are just a mathematical description and actually the physics itself has a deeper reality than the math that we use to describe it. And so for those in the audience, and I'm thoroughly dating myself with this at this point, but there's an, a book called Then and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance from many, many decades ago. And in it, there's a description of the map is not the territory. And that's the point. In many cases, the math is a good description. It gets us a long way. It describes lots of things. But it is finally not the same as the physics. And so I'm obviously speaking here as an experimentalist. I'm sure many theorists view the world with, with a different lens, but that's the way I like to think of it. OK, so let's, I want to talk a little more about what is an amorphous material. And I'm going to start with what is a solid, what is a liquid, what is a gas. Mostly things you'll all know so that I can get you into what is a, an amorphous material. So let's start with, at high temperature, atoms form gases. They might be bonded into molecules. So for example, N nitrogen and oxygen pair up and form an O2 or an N2 molecule. But the molecules are very far apart and they move around a lot. Okay. When we start cooling it, the atoms and molecules start to interact and they condense into a liquid. Um, the liquid is, there is disordered. There is no long range order in a liquid. The atoms and molecules are now bonded together and rather like a solid. And in fact, the energy of a liquid is very close to the energy of a solid. You really have gotten all your chemical bonds. But there's still a lot of entropy. Um, things are still disordered. They're very close together, but they're still moving around. And one of the points I want to make is none of this is random. So the thing I showed you on the page before, which looked like a big jumbled mess, it is nonetheless not random. Only the ideal gas is really a random, where the atom positions are actually random, where it's a flat distribution. If you know where one is, it's equally probably the next one is any distance away. That's not true with any liquid. So one of the more important points is that liquids and amorphous materials tend to have short range order. And in fact, their short range order tends to be the same as it would be in the crystalline state. There are the same atoms. They have the same uh, atomic shell structures. So they tend to like to bond in the same way with other atoms. 
So the short range order in a liquid is often very, very close to the, to, to the short range order in a, in a crystal material. Okay, let's keep going. If I cool a liquid, the atoms or molecules then freeze into a solid, which is usually an ordered crystal. But if I cool a liquid fast, and we usually call that quenching it, it becomes a glass. So you are all at least loosely, I would imagine, familiar with this. If you blow glass, or if you've ever watched glass being blown, you melt the glass, and then you start cooling it. And there's a range where, it, by the way, it's not crystalline when it's done. When it's done, it is a glass. That's where the word came from. But there's a, there's a period in between where it's very thick and viscous, which is the time when you're working it. So that's the time when you get to blow and expand it and move it around. So it's kind of neither liquid nor solid at that point. It's a very gooey, thick liquid. All right? So you can think of this glassy state. If you think of quenching it, window glass, it turns out you can cool incredibly slowly. That's why it's such a, you know, that's why people make beautiful objects out of it, because you can cool it slowly. You've got a long time to be able to form it and shape it while it's still this just gooey, viscous stuff. Many things you have to cool, crunch pretty quickly. But the point is, you can think of it, it's almost like a snapshot of the liquid. So you have this liquid state, and it's almost like you just went, took a, a flash camera to, and took a quick picture of one moment in time. That would be one of the states of the, of the glass. If you then cooled it another time, it'd be like a different state. But that's, that's, one, that's a good way of looking at it. You've, you've taken a snapshot, snapshot of the liquid. There is another way of making what, we, what is often called a glass, but I will quickly start calling it an amorphous material, somewhat of a historical distinction. You can instead condense atoms or molecules directly onto a substrate. So what do I mean by that? Well, you all are familiar, if you boil water and you stick something up above the boiling water, you'll condense stuff onto it. When you do that, it can either could be condensing into a crystalline structure, but it often will also condense into a what we usually call amorphous, a historical distinction without any meaning at this point. You could equally well call it a glassy system. One of the points is it is what it is not, which is a frequent, I think, a poor terminology. Sometimes people refer to this as vapor quenching. So when you actually when you evaporate the atoms and they land on a substrate. If you're calling that vapor quenching, the reason I find that very misleading term is liquid quenching actually is the liquid getting frozen. Vapor quenching, you're not quenching the vapor. It's not like you've taken a, a, you know, a snapshot of the atoms in this room. They're very far apart. So it, it really isn't vapor quenching, but it is a terminology that's often used. So it depends on the type of atoms or molecules what happens. So sometimes it makes a disordered structure, which is traditionally called amorphous, but is really equal to glassy. If there's things like hard spheres, because of the nature of their shells, and that's stuff like copper or gold or iron, they usually make metallic structures. But atoms that have very strong covalent bonds, like silicon and germanium, they have these like P bonds that stick out, tend to make these amorphous structures. It's they're more easily frustrated. A way of thinking of that is if I took a bunch of hard, uh, of, um, like ball bearings, and I threw them in a box and I jumbled them around. If you looked in, you'd probably expect to see them in sort of that orange packing kind of you know, nearest neighbor, little triangles and one in the middle and six around. And that is what you'd find. So it's very, it's, it's hard to not get, to, to, to get that not to happen is very difficult. But if instead you threw in a bunch of jacks, you know, the, to, the toys, you would expect to see them not ordered. And so that's sort of a loose analogy, very loose to the, to the idea of the P bonds and so forth. You mean like filled S orbitals, and then they're, they're right. sitting there, and they, they, they pack together the way we see s spheres pack together? Yes, with one extension. So w literally spheres, like the, the, um, the noble gases, yes. they will make close-packed structures, and they will, it's very hard to get them to be amorphous. But even things like copper, which actually has one outermost electron, it's still a spherical shell. So it doesn't have to be a filled S shell. It can be a single electron in an S shell. Right, thank you. <clears throat> okay. So, just showing the structures again. All right, so let me, I'm going to talk a fair amount today about silicon. So let me show you what silicon looks like. So there is, the, there is the crystalline silicon. So crystalline silicon makes a diamond structure, just like carbon does. And that, that structure, actually, if you look at like one atom, it has four neighbors, four little bonds. It's a little tetrahedron, OK, 109.5 degrees between the angles of each of those bonds. And that is, that's the crystal structure for, um, for crystalline silicon. Now, if I make it amorphous, what happens is you still have that same local order. You still have that same tetrahedron with 
it has to be not quite 109.5. In fact, it turns out to make it, you, this has been proven, I think, mathematically, that you have to have a certain distribution. So instead of all the angles being exactly 109.5, it turns out that's plus or minus, there's a width to that, about 8 to 10 degrees. So that's quite a bit of broadening, but on the other hand, 109 plus or minus 8 degrees, it is still mostly tetrahedrally bonded. I mean, the angle is only a very small amount off of that perfect tetrahedron. It turns out the bond lengths are really preserved. So the silicon to silicon distances are almost exactly what they are in the crystalline state. The bond angle, just a little bit of variation, and that's enough to make this sort of jumbled mess of a structure. So what does it look like if you see it? Well, these are some electron mic microscopy images. And let me start with the bottom one. It's going to turn out that one of my main variables, I told you to think of it, I'm going to do vapor deposition, so I'm going to boil the material. So I'm going to boil silicon and then condense it onto a substrate. Now, I don't do that in a pot on a stove, obviously. Um, among other things, it would oxidize. But I do it in an ultra-high vacuum system, and I boil it by shooting an electron beam at it. But in the end, I boil it. In the end, I literally have a little pot of silicon dump a whole ton of electrons in the middle, and it gets hot and melts, and atoms evaporate. So when I do that, they land on a substrate. And as you can imagine, just from the analogy of putting a, you know, a cover slide or something above a pot of water, the temperature of that substrate matters. So the temperature at which I grow the film, not the temperature of the silicon. The silicon is glowing orange hot molten. But the temperature of the, the substrate that I'm using to grow the film. That's going to matter. And so this is a film grown at 45 centigrade, and this is a film grown at 400 centigrade. And this is a high-resolution electron microscope picture, transition TEM, and both of them are. And you don't see anything. That was sort of my entire point here. There's really nothing to see. If you look hard in a little bit higher resolution image, just an image on the screen, not, um, you can see little dots. It's kind of like atoms. They're not actually rigorously, it's a Fourier transform of a of a Fourier transform. But the end result is there's no difference between those that you can see. This is the low resolution, bigger scale image. And again, no significant difference. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, is it, is it that one of them, you, if you looked at the underlying structure, is crystalline? No, the they are is, both amorphous. They're both amorphous. They're both amorphous. And what it's going to turn out is the properties are really different. So the point I'm going to want to make here is that the properties are actually pretty different, yet just looking at these pictures, they really look the same. Um, and so one of the issues with the amorphous structure is everything is a big, broad distribution. So you're trying to look for subtle differences in big, broad distributions, and it's a painful process. So, you, it's, so I'll come back to that point, but my only point here is really they look the same. So you have to be more nuanced in what you're looking at than just a bunch of images like this. Um, another really interesting thing about silicon. So window glass, silica, which is SiO2, I just finished saying that is like the world's easiest thing to quench from a liquid. You can even quench it rather slowly. I mean, you have minutes. When you're, if you're blowing glass, you literally have minutes sitting in air that you can blow it and work it where it stays still kind of gooey and liquidy. But you can't quench silicon. And the reason you can't quench silicon is kind of interesting. The high temperature, the liquid state of silicon turns out to be five-fold coordinated. And that is entirely about entropy. And when I say entropy, it's the number of ways you can arrange things. So on average, every silicon atom in there is trying to be four-fold coordinated. But it gains so much free energy, entropy in other words, that it is better for it to have this sort of constantly changing set of bonds and who it's bonded to, and it ends up being effectively five-fold coordinated. So the liquid is significantly denser than, than, the, uh, than the solid, which is, of course, unusual. Usually things, by the way, what's the other example of that, that where the solid ends up less dense than the liquid? Water. And there are interesting analogies between water and silicon, so I'm not going to say much more about that. But it is an interesting phenomenon to have the liquid be denser than the solid. Um, OK, so once, but the, in, the intriguing part is it's actually extremely easy to make it by vapor deposition. So you make it directly into this, um, into this amorphous state. And in fact, you can make it up to pretty high temperatures, and it will still be amorphous. One thing about that is, when you make thin films, you don't make large quantities. In fact, a microgram is quite a bit to make as a thin film. 
And so if that's too, that is uh, too small to, for traditional heat capacity measurements. And as was mentioned briefly, and I'm not going to, well, I'll show you some data, but I, one of the things I specialize in is, is using silicon micromachining to make little tiny calorimeters on a chip so I can make heat capacity measurements on very tiny samples, including the amorphous silicon that I'm going to show you. Okay. Now, how many people in the room actually know what entropy is? Okay, so we will just charge right along and, and try and give you some idea. Um, I'm going to start with energy because energy is easier. So this is what's called an energy landscape. So let me explain what this is. And I'm going to start with the easiest point on this plot, which is the crystal. So if I have a crystal, a, a, a um, crystal of silicon, I know where every atom is, I can calculate its binding energy. And the binding energy is the energy difference between when all the atoms were really far apart and now that they're in a solid state, what's their energy? So the energy goes lower, that's the point, the crystalline state is a lower energy than the, gas, than the gaseous state. And so that crystalline state has an energy and I put a dot right there to represent that energy. So the, the y-axis here is energy, the x-axis is what I'm going to call the coordinate, <laughs> okay? And so that is, a, that, is the co that is the place where I choose to put the crystalline sample. Now, I'm going to take that same bunch of atoms, and this time I'm not going to let it be a crystal. I'm going to just jumble them together, and I'm going to say, okay, for this particular arrangement of jumbled together silicon atoms, what is the binding energy? And then I'm, it, you know, I'm just going to say, like, let's say right there. It doesn't matter. Pick a point one of those points there is going to be that energy. Then I'm going to make a different jumble of atoms, and I'm going to calculate its energy, and then I'll get another point. Where I put it on the x-axis is, is, a, is a theoretical construct. I'm, I'm going to put things that are near each other in configuration space near each other on this axis. So what that gives me is a bunch of is bumps like this, okay? So that things that are kind of near each other have sim sort of similar energies, and then to get to another state, you might have to go over a potential well, potential barrier, and get to another state. But that's the idea. This is called an energy landscape. The idea is in all of this, and I've drawn, drawn this rather deliberately, there is an ideal glass. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean by that something rather simple. It's the lowest energy state that is not a crystal, okay? So that's nice and makes, I hopefully makes sense to everybody that there is, you know, most states will be, have higher energy. Some state that is not a crystalline state will have lower energy than all the other states. So that's fine, at least hopefully that makes sense to people. The interesting thing is there's a connection to entropy. So now entropy, I'm going to start to, by defining it statistically. Entropy has to do with how many ways you can get the same energy. So the entropy of a perfect crystal is zero. There is exactly one, it's actually the log of the number of ways. So there's exactly one way I can make the perfect crystal. In this diagram, there's only one way that I can make that lowest energy state. So low energy and low entropy, meaning the logarithm of the number of ways I can make the state, kind of go together. All right. Now comes sort of the magic of those of you who've taken statistical mechanics will recognize the concept of entropy predates any of this statistical description. The concept of entropy was first derived from pure thermodynamics. People were doing cycles of like engines and things like that, and they realized there had to be another variable. And that is really the best description you will get for that. There had to be another variable. There was another property that needed to be there to explain how cycles of engines and so forth worked. That other and that other property, which they called entropy, because it was sort of like an energy, but it wasn't like an energy, was called entropy. But it was I, oh, 100 or more years before people connected that thermodynamic property of entropy to this statistical description, but they are the same thing. Okay, Sort of an, a remarkable history of how this came to be, that the thermodynamic quantity of entropy, which we usually get by doing like an integral of the heat capacity over temperature, where the energy is the integral of the heat capacity, not divided by T with temperature, that they end up, that that is the same as the statistical definition of the logarithm of the number of states. So the point I'm making is that low energy state is also low entropy. And the thing that's sort of remarkable is what I'm going to show you is we think we have a way of making that. So going back now, this is getting back to the thermodynamic description. 
what I'm showing you here, and I've actually chosen to plot entropy, but you could, if you wanted to think of it as an experimental measurement, you would think of it as C over T, specific heat over temperature. So I'm going to start up here at high temperature. So at high temperature, I have a, it's in the liquid state. I'm cooling it down. It has, it's, a, it's, the, it's the equilibrium phase at high temperature. So in the equilibrium phase, there is no question that I can talk about the enthalpy, the entropy, all of the thermodynamic properties. So there is the entropy being plotted as a function of temperature. looks like that. When I hit the freeze, melting or freezing temperature, in equilibrium, this should drop down to the crystal. So there's a, it's a first order phase transition, liquid to frozen. Discon discontinuity in the entropy, and then I have the, the entropy of the glass, uh, sorry, of the crystal, which goes to zero at t equals zero. So that would be the equilibrium thing where I have liquid, crystal, and then t equals zero. In a liquid that I super cool, what happens is I'm now, I don't crystallize. Now, why I don't crystallize has to more to do with kinetics than anything else. It's not really a fundamental thing, but some things don't easily crystallize. Usually that's because the, the to crystallize, you have to nucleate a crystal. So you know that in many things, it's easy to supercool. It's also easy to superheat. This is a first order transition, so it's not hard to actually just not crystallize, in which case you continue to follow the liquid line. So now I'm in a supercool liquid state. Still, it's not the ground state anymore, but there's still no problem talking about entropy and enthalpy. It is a state where in here I can go back and forth a little bit, so all my thermodynamic functions are actually well defined. It doesn't matter that it's not the ground state. It's still a thermodynamic state. So I supercool the liquid, and then at some point in here is where it's getting more and more and more viscous, less and less like a liquid, but still a liquid. And then at some point it gets so viscous that it falls out of equilibrium and becomes a glass. If I cool more slowly, I can follow that line further. If I wait longer, I can follow down that line further. And what happens is I get a whole family of curves, depending how fast I cool, like that. What a man named Kautzman realized um, quite a long time ago also is that you cannot do this experimentally. If you cool it, you will eventually, so when I'm talking about cooling more slowly, you hit the point where it's beyond the lifetime of the universe. So nonetheless, you can extrapolate that line, not worry about the fact that it has to be beyond the lifetime of the universe. And what you'll find is if you extrapolate that down, you hit a temperature at which the entropy of the liquid is the entropy of the crystal. So that is kind of a wild statement because entropy is something statistical. It has to do with how many ways you can rearrange it and how disordered it is is usually considered an important part of that. And I just told you, this is not a quantum liquid. This is not, I've not made super fluid, you know, I've not made super fluid silica or something like that. It is a classical liquid, and yet it has the entropy equal to that of the, of the crystal. That is that ideal glass state. Okay, so that is the thermodynamic description is at this what's called the Kaltzman temperature. I have made that ideal glass. So the problem is, and the reason there's all these lines here, is usually what happens is you're cooling down. You start at high temperature, and you're bouncing around between all of these states. And as you cool down, you get trapped into one of these basins. And so you never find that state. Okay? Even if you found it in one part of the sample by accident, another part of the sample would be over here. So you never, you don't find that state. But it is out there theoretically. This is not completely made up. I'm actually going to show you why I think we, we have done, we've done this. And just as a preview, how did we circumvent this, this viscosity argument around the glass? We're not going to make these by liquid quenching. We're going to make them by vapor deposition. So it's a whole different way of arriving at a state. And I'm going to show you why we think we are getting there. All right. So, I told, so the topic of this talk was disorder and how properties arise, exotic physics and applications arise. I shouldn't really say either because of or despite disorder. So you, both could be true. But one of the nice things about amorphous materials is they're often very flat and, they're, and very smooth. And so they're useful for a whole lot of applications. And that in particular includes something, um, the dielectric mirrors that are used for the LIGO gravity wave detectors. And this is an interesting one because I've actually just joined the LIGO collaboration because we have a way of making materials that is going to be better than any of the materials they're currently making. Well, we'll see if it is better. The hope is that it's going to be better. We have a way, we have a way of approaching the problem that nobody's tried before. That may, it, it turns out the leading source of noise in the LIGO, does everybody know LIGO? Do I need to, 
Yes, okay. So the leading source of noise in the LIGO, uh, these huge giant masses, of their test masses, the leading source of noise is the coatings that leads them to have the mirrors. It's, it's called thermal noise, but it's a really, it has to, I'll show you in a while what it comes from, but it is because of the disorder in the amorphous oxides that they use for their coatings. And I have a way of making more ordered, disordered materials. Um, yes? Can I ask you, McKenna, so this may not be the general question, but I want to, <laughs> but I want to ask this one because, so as opposed to a crystalline structure, Right. The crystalline structure, you would imagine, you could imagine this planar state, which would mm -hmm. be ultimately smooth. Right. And so when you're saying that these amorphous materials can get really smooth, mm -hmm. it's because real crystals have those defects. And then are right. we talking about comparing the scale of that versus this very regular, you know, I don't even know how to describe the order of this disordered Loosely, yes. So yes is the answer. The thing with the crystal is, first thing is, it, it, it doesn't self-smooth the same way. Um, if you make it at low temperatures, you end up with defects all through it. If you make it at high temperatures, it tends to do things like faceting. So in principle, you could have you know, a perfect 1-0 plane or something like that, but it would still be better for it to ball up. So it inherently is always trying to ball up. These you make at this intermediate temperature, and you don't have the same issue of defects. It's a, or at least I should put it differently. It's a different kind of defects. So in, it's almost, I mean, I don't know anybody who even has really tried to make crystalline materials to be like perfect dielectric coatings. They tend to make pinholes and things like that. It's, it's um, yeah, so I th it's a good question why this actually works better, but that's probably the best description I can give, is you're, you're at this intermediate temperature where the amorphous material ends up being more forgiving and flatter than, than the crystalline. I think that's a great answer. Just one more thing, which is naively, I'm taking this amorphous to mean, you know, this, this non-ordered structure. And so this idea of if it was ordered structure and ordered structure, I was, I was taken by your discussion of the vapor deposition and thinking of like a cold window and you can have it form as water mm, droplets from right. the humidity in house mm -hmm. or it's cold enough outside and I'm from Wisconsin then it would then it would be crystalline when it when it when the water is is um the yeah the so I mean a question of whether it balls up as drops or it goes as a uniform vapor and actually I don't know how far to take this analogy but certainly if it balls up into drops when you lose the drops you leave little wings and things behind and so it's actually much better to have it go down as a uniform vapor than to ball up into little drops. Um, but I think that it's an interesting... But, but amorphous, you're saying, there's no local ordered structure, so you can't build up these pyramids or some right. structure on it that would keep it from being right. very flat. To be exact, there's probably no... It's not... There is lots of short range order. There's even some medium range order, but there's no further distance. And so that is... It's sort of an optimized point, I guess. Is, yeah, probably. Okay, you're welcome. Um, all right, so what the LIGO actually uses, they use, they use multi-layers of amorphous silicon oxide with tantalo, so just out of interest. All right, so this is just an example. As I said, I make them by vapor deposition. This is a picture of my lab. This is a picture of the little silicon micromachine calorimeters that we make, um, and I'm not going to say a lot about how, if somebody's curious about it. I can tell you more about how we do that and what's the point, but it does allow us. It is silicon micromachining. It allows us to do heat capacity of very of thin films. Okay. So I think I won't go through all of this. This is when we, ca you know, we do lots of measurements when we make these materials. So there are lots of things we vary. We, we, the most important is the growth temperature. We vary the growth rate. We vary the thickness. We do all sorts of measurements to try and characterize their short range order and their medium range order and their you know, lack of long range order. Uh, we do positron spectroscopy to try and look at nanovoids. We do fluctuation electron microscopy, et cetera. So we do lots and lots of structural characterization. And then the heat capacity is perhaps the most important because, as I said, we're trying to get at a thermodynamic quantity. So first thing, uh, first plot I'm going to show you is the density. And what this plot is, is a, it, this is a plot of the density, and it's the number of atoms per cubic centimeter, um, as a function of the thickness of the film on a long scale and how it varies with growth temperature. So there is the highest growth temperature that we use, 700 Kelvin. There is what happens at the density of 500. There is what happens at, at 325. We can also vary deposition rate. You can see the density varies. So 
lots of things vary as a function of how you prepare them. You'll notice that the, the highest density films occur for the highest growth temperature, the thickest films, and the lowest rates. So if I give more time for the atoms on the surface to move around, the thickness is an interesting question why it gets better with thickness that we're still, we're actually still trying to understand this plot, like why does thickness matter so much? Um, these are local effects. But it does, as it gets thicker, the density does go up. Um, and slower is just giving it more time to move around on the surface. Uh, and so in what length, what, you know, these density changes, there's lots of things that could change. There's things called dangling bonds, there's sort of a macro scale columnar structure, there's variations of the bond angle disorder, there's things we call medium range, et cetera, et cetera. And so one of the issues is trying to figure out what is changing and, and what, what do we care about, what don't we care about. Um, so I'm now going to turn to my first non-silicon example. I'm going to run through a few examples and then um, come back at the end to silicon. So this is an alloy of terbium with iron. And so it's magnetic. It's actually a pretty good magnet. It has a chemical temperature well above room temperature. It can be made either amorphous or crystalline depending on composition, depending on growth temperature. And this is sort of a phase diagram of that. So if I grow at, at low concentrations of terbium, it ends up crystalline. At, as I go to higher, more and more terbium, I get to a whole region where it ends up amorphous. As I go at higher temperatures, it ends up crystalline. But you can see there's a fair amount of, of uh, phase space in here where I can make amorphous terbium ion. So, okay, well that's fine. It's magnetic. The thing that is interesting about it is it, it's anisotropic. So what do I mean by that? Well, the first thing is you would think that amorphous would mean that all directions look the same. And in fact, this, was, this literally is work, this plot is literally a scan from way back before we had computers to make graphics. This is from my postdoc period. So I was actually giving an interview talk for an assistant professor, and I said, talked about it, how this is anisotropic, and one of the audience members actually said, if it's anisotropic, it can't be amorphous, because amorphous, by definition, should be the same in all directions. And I was trying to be polite because I was, after all, in an interview talk. Um, but I said, if that were true, that if I handed you a material that you agree is amorphous, and you give it back to me, and I squash it, and put pressure on it, in other words, uniaxial pressure, I've now made it anisotropic. And I said, would you then tell me it was no longer amorphous, just because I've changed the direction that I've squashed it in relative to the other two directions? And that, that actually. I mean, clearly you haven't. You haven't changed something. It's not become not amorphous because I've squashed it. So what's happening here is basically, and this is an important point, when I vapor deposit, the atoms land on the surface. And it's actually the other way up, but imagine the atoms are landing on a surface like this. And they move around this way. So they have a lot of lateral mobility, but they have no vertical mobility. They get buried. So this anisotropy that I'm talking about is a remembrance of the way it grew, that out of plane is different than in plane. So the sort of interesting thing is that this anisotropy gets bigger as I go to higher growth temperatures. So it isn't a memory in the sense of like, you know, if I showered them down, like they get stuck in like a you know, pile of wet sand or something like that. This is that the more mobility I give it, the more anisotropic it becomes. So this is, a, this is all connected to minimization of surface energy in a way. And the end result is I get to, these numbers don't mean anything to you, nor should they, but this is actually quite a lot of magnetic anisotropy. And it turns out that amorphous terbium iron and its perpendicular magnetic anisotropy makes it actually quite important for the magnetic recording industry. So this rather obscure effect, and by the way, the fact that it is magnetically anisotropic means it must be structurally anisotropic. We believe it's because there's more terbium iron pairs out of the plane and more iron iron pairs in the plane. But it is a very subtle structural anisotropy. Like I said from the beginning, these are big broad distributions and you've got a tiny shift, like little more terbium iron out of plane, little more iron iron in plane, is enough to give you a really large effect. That effect is, as I said, been useful for various versions of magnetic recording. But I want to show you in particular, this is just an interesting one, it causes kind of interesting magnetic domain structures. So these are all magnetic force microscopy, basically a way of imaging magnetic domains of amorphous terbium iron. And I can get stripes like that, I can get stripes like this, I can get kind of wiggly stripes, depending on how I, how I magnetize it. 
You can even get bubbles. And so this was, you know, it, by it, imagine taking something like that and then you turn off the field by like rotating it, you can end up creating bubble domains. So that was part of why this was a big deal. More recently, people have been very hot on the topic of skirmions. And what skirmions are, I've shown them schematically here. Because it's magnetized out of the plane, and that, by the way, in and out are equal. It can't care which. Um, imagine that the center of this sort of bubble-like thing, I have it pointing down, and then all the way out here, it's pointing up. So that's like, a, that's like a domain. But it does it with a particular chirality. And so in this image, the chirality is out. It, sorry, yes, it, no, it starts down, and then it goes out like that. There would also be one where it went, starts down. Oh, my arms are not going to work this way. It has to go, uh, <laughs> yes. It could also have gone in, I guess. Let's see. I don't know. Um, you also have, can have left or right chiralities. And so these skirmions are a very hot topic these days. If you take amorphous terbium iron and you layer it with a material like platinum, heavy element, lots of spin orbit coupling, it turns out that that, that interface has a unique property. The fact that I have terbiums and irons pointing this way and then platinum with its strong spin orbit coupling, which has a sign to it, tells me, makes the, the terbium irons not just want to point parallel to each other, but there's actually a cross product. And that cross product gives it actually a left-right chirality. So that is a whole topic in and of itself, and people are very excited about using skirmions. It turns out they're topologically protected. They don't go away very easily. So you can move them around, and there's a theory that they'll move around really fast, and that they'll move, they'll, you know, that, that will be, a bit will be up or a bit will be down. Um, and so that is one of the hot topics right now, again, in, in physics. Okay, so moving, whoops. Moving on. Another thing about amorphous silicon is it's very conducive to doping. And when I say doping, I mean introducing other elements. So gadolinium. Gadolinium is one of the four F elements. It's huge compared to silicon. It's just this enormous ion. You cannot put gadolinium into crystalline silicon. It precipitates out. I mean, there's a tiny, tiny, you can get like a part in 10 to the 8 at, at high temperatures because of entropy enables things like that. But in general, you can't put gadolinium into crystalline silicon. But the amorphous structure, so this is a schematic of, um, done by a, a theoretical colleague of mine. The blue are the gadoliniums. And you'll, there's, if you look at just the yellows, you'll see the same tetrahedral bonds that I showed you before. But around the gadoliniums, they make these funny little cages. If you look in detail, every one of the silicons in this funny little cage is still tetrahedrally bonded, but they're kind of flattened. And so they end up with this cage-like structure around each gadolinium. But one atom away, they're back to their nice tetrahedral bonds. So the amorphous structure is very forgiving. So why would I want to do this? Well, I'm a magnetician. There's a whole body of work around taking silicon and doping it. I mean, in fact, all of our semiconductor industry is based on doping. A funny thing happens, so when you start doping silicon, you start off with it being an insulator. You add elements, to, some element to it, more and more and more, and eventually it actually becomes a metal. The transition from insulating to metallic is a very fundamental transition. It, it actually, a lot of exotic physics happens at that transition. Qualitatively, you can think of it as that an insulator, the electrons don't move, so they have no kinetic energy. In the metallic state, they do move, and they have lots of kinetic energy. So you can think of an insulator as being driven by potential energy, the metal being driven by kinetic energy. This is obviously rather loose, but one can make this rigorous. The transition between the two is where the energies are equal. Anytime you have two energies that are equal, they're susceptible to being tipped. So in particular, all sorts of exotic physics happens there around that balance, that, uh, that competition between energies. One of the things that happens is the electrons are suddenly occupying single states, singly occupied states. Usually the electrons always end up in these paired states, one spin up and one spin down. At that metal insulator transition, they occupy single states, the singly occupied states. And because of that, they have a spin. They are now magnetic. They're not really ferromagnets, but they have a magnetic moment. So I'm a magnetician. This was sort of an interesting idea that you could take something utterly non-magnetic and suddenly make it look magnetic because of this sort of odd effect that happens at the metal insulator transition. So I decided I wanted to see what happened if I put real magnets in here. So that was the, the genesis of this 
like project of putting rare earths in here. Let's put a, you know, gadolinium has an enormous magnetic moment. So we tried putting gadolinium in. And indeed what happened was actually quite interesting. This is a plot. This is now the conductivity of gadolinium doped silicon, turns out at 13%, on a log scale as a function of temperature. It's inverse temperature, so there's room temperature up here on the left. This is low temperature here on the right. At zero field, this is strongly, strongly insulating. As I apply a magnetic field, it becomes more and more and more and more metallic. This hasn't gone all the way through. Fully metallic would be flat. But it is heading up towards being a metal. And if, if I actually do 13.5%, I can go right through the metal insulator transition. And all sorts of exotic physics happen. We had, so we had a way of studying the metal insulator transition in a single sample just by varying the magnetic field. Okay? And in a way, the simple way of capturing that is that the, um, the gadoliniums, the magnetic moments of the gadoliniums are all disordered. So it's like an extra source of disorder. And then when I apply a large magnetic field, they line up. So that disorder goes away. And that allows the electrons to move more freely. So I can drive a metal insulator transition in this material just by applying a magnetic field. And just loosely, this is a magneto resistance of 10 to the fifth at 1 Kelvin. It's not hard to estimate. This becomes too insulating to measure, but you know this is a nice straight line. So you would have 10 to the 17th at 150 millikelvin. So it's a really spectacularly large magneto resistance. All right, so that was one example. I'm going to whip through a couple of other examples and then get back to the silicon. We also looked at crystalline and amorphous silicon. So there's, in the crystalline state, you can have different forms of chemical order. And so we were interested in, we did, there's all the different chemical orders. And there's my amorphous blob again. And one of the interesting things that happens is it turns out that in the amorphous state, it's more magnetic than it is in the crystalline state. So again, the disorder is actually helping the magnetism. Um, the, something called the anomalous Hall effect, which is a um, fairly sophisticated property of materials. The anomalous Hall effect, this is a whole bunch of compositions, but all the ones at the top are the amorphous ones, and all the ones at the bottom are the crystalline ones. So it turned out the anomalous Hall effect was huge in these materials. And perhaps even more interestingly, getting back to my very first point, all the descriptions of the anomalous Hall effect in the crystalline materials rely on this perfect periodic structure. But we're seeing the same effect. In fact, in some ways, you can, it's, it seems larger, depends what you normalize by. But we're seeing it in a non-crystalline material. And so there is now a paper out. We, we speculated that we should not be thinking of this effect as requiring a crystalline structure. And sort of within about, I, they hadn't seen our paper yet. It had just come out. But a, a theory paper came out saying the same thing, that you could actually, that you didn't have to have the crystalline structure. This is a local effect. And you can think of it in a local description. You don't have to have the, um, the crystalline structure to get the anomalous Hall effect. Now, I'm not going to talk at all about this because we're too close out of time. But topological insulators is another example where everybody is convinced you have to have the crystalline structure. And there is a theory paper out now that says, no, you don't. So we're debating whether we're going to start trying to make amorphous topological insulators. I'm, we'll see. Um, so, all right. So the last thing I want to show you, just a few slides about, because I started with this. So the other, one of the other, and this connects back to why the LIGO folks are interested in our work. The other great problem of glasses, in addition to this Kautzmann paradox I talked to you about, is their low temperature property. So if I look at the low temperature heat capacity, the low temperature heat capacity of a solid is supposed to look like gamma T plus beta T cubed, where the gamma T is the metal term, for those of you who know this, and the beta T cubed is due to the phonons, the lattice. So an insulator should only have the beta T cubed piece. And indeed, Chris, this is the plot. The red is the plot for crystalline silicon dioxide. And you can, the low T part, you can actually theoretically calculate if you know the sound velocity. So you measure the sound velocity. And from that, you calculate the low temperature heat capacity. And that's that little dashed red line. And indeed, you can see the crystalline material is coming in very nicely to that value. So there's a theory for this. It's called the Debye theory of, of heat capacity. You make the amorphous material, and you can see there's the, the sound velocity is a little different. Sound velocity is a little lower, which leads to a little higher heat capacity. It's that blue line. But this is not only not coming into it, it's turning the other way. This is a plot of C over T cubed to get rid of the T cubed dependence. 
What this is, is a huge linear term, not huge, a linear term. Linear term will always look huge it's by the time you get to low enough temperatures. So where is that coming from? This is a temperature range where the phonons, the, the vibrations of the lattice, are at very long wavelength. And it should not matter the details of the crystal structure. So this was a huge mystery. And it was resolved, pointing back at that uh, energy landscape I showed you before, and expanding that scale to here. There was a theory that was developed. Um, yep, stop, let me go back. Theory that was developed uh, actually not 1997, but more like in the, uh, the 80s, what's called tunnel, tunneling level systems. So the best description of that is that I have a whole bunch of atoms, and they can shift just a little bit from here to here, and the energy has to go over a potential well to do that. But because it can go from here to here, it will thermally activate, or it can tunnel. And because it can tunnel, you get an, an admixture of those two states. And that admixture of those two states is what you see in the heat capacity. That is the source of that extra linear term. All right, so we see that in our, in our amorphous silicon. We see these big upturns. Depends on temperature, on the growth temperature, and various other variables. The high temperature films going at 400 C have, have essentially none. The ones at lower, uh, going at lower temperatures have a lot. Let's, let's, let's skip past this. This is just, we have a bunch of data points of this, and so it de we've shown that it depends on density. The thing I want to say is that getting back to this plot, the point is that single state has no TLS. That lowermost state, there are no low-lying nearby states, so there are no tunneling states. So in a big picture way, we've now connected a high temperature property, how something comes through the glass transition and this ideal glass with this concept of TLS. And so getting rid of these TLS gets rid of this extra heat capacity, but those TLS are also what led to all the losses that are bad for the LIGO detectors. So our getting rid of TLS, and so far we've only managed to do that in amorphous silicon. They don't want amorphous silicon, they want things like silica and tantala. But the hope is that the techniques that we've developed for silicon will also apply to these other materials. So we have these two hypotheses. One is that vapor deposition is offering us a way to access that low-lying ideal glass, which you can never get by liquid quenching, because you can grow at that temperature and have surface mobility. And two is that the ideal glass has no nearby energy minimum, so no TLS. So we're currently doing experiments to see if, those two, see if we can test those two hypotheses. And with that. I'm going to show you, just for fun, some examples of a liquid, a liquid magnet, which is a fair fluid. If you've never seen one, you should look at the beautiful pictures online. And last, I was going to show you some beautiful pictures of scuba diving to just prove that I don't only work. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So what happened to the total thickness of each sample? Did it have the same thickness or the actually uh, mm. different thickness? So there is a dependence. That density plot showed that the density depends on thickness. The magnetic anisotropy, to first, to pretty good order, does not depend on thickness. But we mostly were only looking at pretty thick films back then. Um, you, you notice there that we had no rate, no significant rate dependence, but that is on a linear scale. So again, there, there probably is a very small rate dependence also. Um, one, of the, one of the differences and one of the details in all of this is that perpendicular magnetic anisotropy, I think, is truly a local effect. It's really like individual terbium iron atoms, and so a very local effect, where I think there's quite a good deal of local order that then gets lined up as opposed to the silicon, where I think we're talking about slightly larger medium range order being what matters. So different effects may have, will have different dependencies on thickness and rate and things like that. Right, but you, I imagine if the film gets really thick, you should start to see the isotropic behavior. Mm. Uh, and that's why I... I don't think so. So we've grown pretty thick and they don't, this really is, it will continue growing that way because there's always a surface. Um, 
Yeah, so I don't, I don't think that would happen. I mean, the, to, the li, to the limit that we've, we've grown pretty thick films and they're still perpendicular. Right, I guess I'm talking about like a millimeter range, it's something that really close to a bulk material. To so I know, because as long as it was grown, it remembers that it was grown, or it, it, as long as it was grown, it had those surfaces that form. So even if it's, even at a millimeter, it would still be there. Now, what would happen in all cases is if I anneal it, they relax. And as soon as they relax, they lose that structure. And so you might have even noticed that there's a turnover, like the, the anisotropy went up and it turned over. That turning over is where there's the, the, the bulk is starting to have mobility. And as soon as the bulk has mobility, then it tends to relax. So I, that all of these interesting anisotropic effects happen in the temperature range where I have lots of surface mobility but absolutely no bulk mobility. So I think that's, you know, that's at some point, so I don't think thickness will ever matter, but as soon as you start annealing it, it would relax and become isotropic again. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let the students go. We're going to go at 5 o'clock, and the rest of us will stay for this question. So please, Dr. Shee, hold your question. Thank, let's thank the speaker one more time. <laughs> Thanks, you too. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I don't know how I managed to leave mine behind and then. Oh, you'll find it. Oh, okay. <laughs> that is not what I usually travel with. I usually have a backpack, so I think that's the problem. Thank you. But thank you very much for lending that. Um, Dr. Shee, continue that question. It was about the. the, the Bulk material. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the anisotropy. Because I thought that uh, if you start to get something thick enough, you start to lose the shape anisotropy. Mm. So once the stain. Yes. But the problem with that argument, if I want to get all the way back to that plot. <laughs> yeah. So the problem with that argument is the shape anisotropy is competing all the time. Shape always wants to be, have the magnetism in, be in the plane. Right. So the thicker I get, if anything, that gets less. So this, this, <coughs> this anisotropy, which is oddly usually called magnetocrystalline anisotropy, despite the fact that it's not crystalline at all, but it is connected to the structure. So this anisotropy being out of plane is always competing with the in plane. So all that's going to happen as it gets thicker is the in plane will get less, which will make, if anything, the out of plane even be more important. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, there's a way in which at some point you might lose track of the surface, like if, if it starts develop, thicker films tend to get um, lumpier, and once things start getting lumpier, the surface is less well, you know, the angle of the surface is less well defined, but I, you know, so I would hesitate to really say that I, I mean, we've never grown a millimeter film, we've grown micron films, at some point, you don't, you may not, the surface may be so rough that the angles are no longer well defined. But, you know, I, I don't know if that would ever happen because it, it would, you know, it's still loosely speaking is a surface and so there's still an outer plane on average. May I follow up on mm -hmm. this? this, this it's this figure that I was, I was wondering about when you showed it. Is mm -hmm. it important for the magnetic recording industry? Mm -hmm. and, so I'm thinking of sort of the propon, uh, this is a toy model, but I thought this might be helpful for some of the students and I might be completely wrong, but okay. right, so, so you're saying this anisotropy, you have more of these things that you can address. If, I, if I've got this and I'm trying to apply and write a one or a zero in mm -hmm. here, this isn't helping me at all. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, except that I don't know how much these actually change under the, the under the magnetic fields we're talking about but if it's all built in then this chart is showing grown in a certain way i have a higher density of the the, the magnetic dipoles that i want to address right. and so right. then this is that first correct and then second is there a way that this then is used by you know, to set recording efficiencies or mm -hmm. size scales for the recording of the, of the bit of information. So 
first thing, the first place this was actually used was in a technology that was called mini disc technology, which actually required was a magneto optic recording system. So it bounced light. And so it had to be out of plane because the polar Kerr effect is the one you need. Um, so there was sort of a practical nature of that. It was, they were actually fairly large bits at that point, but they were using light. It, so it was, the, it was the very first read-write uh, disk technology that existed was magneto-optic effect. So there it was out of plane. They were big. That technology is long gone. We've got about a million ways now to make bits that are, th those were like microns in size. And so there's technologies that are, you know, we're way past that technology. So current, Actually, I think, it, it, I'm not even sure this is true. I was going to say current technology is still using in-plane, but I'm not even sure that's true anymore. It's hard sometimes to keep up with what's, where industry is. But for, for up until at least recently, it was all in-plane. So zeros and ones were just back and forth in-plane. And it was all about, um, I have a slide somewhere in this computer, but not worth finding. So it was all about, the problem with in-plane is you can, have, you can have domains that are butting head to head, and then they'll want to deflect each other. And so there's a minimum, you can't have this be too small, or they're just, they'll end up this way instead of this way. So you can, just like you were saying, if you go to perpendicular bits, you gain a lot in density. And so now, the, the, the part I'm hedging on just a little bit is amorphous turbimion I don't think has ever been envisioned as the material for perpendicular recording. They tend to use things like cobalt, and uh, cobalt chromium, which is, has a crystalline structure, but it has to have little tiny grains. So there's a lot of details in the magnetic recording industry. So it's an exaggerate. They've ne they did use turbimion for that optical, the magneto-optic, but not for the, con the conventional perpendicular recording. At this point, they're using, they are back to using these, these turbium iron like things with these platinum overlayers and making skirmions out of them, but that's not really a technology yet. That's a technology that everybody is hypothesizing could be in the future. But the, so the, but the outer plane is a big deal, and the only way you get, in, it just as was being asked before, shape anisotropy puts everything in plane. So you have to have something that pulls it out of plane, and usually people think of making that be the crystal structure. So they go to a lot of trouble to grow C-axis HCP cobalt with the C-axis out of plane, and that has a reasonably large perpendicular anisotropy. So everybody was rather surprised when this material that's amorphous has a perpendicular anisotropy that's actually at least as large as a material you've deliberately grown crystalline, deliberately grown with a C-axis out of plane, and here you have this blobby mess which has just as big an anisotropy. Thank you, and that was very helpful for, for me. The, the skirmion I'm, I'm not familiar with, is that mm -hmm. then setting a size scale that might be of interest because yes. of knowing the, the, the yeah. topology of it? Yes, and in fact, that size is, there's no length scale in this. This is just a schematic. But the size of a skirmion has, every, has to do with a bunch of competing energies. So one of the energies is, the usual magnetic exchange energy wants everything to line up. This, inner, this spin orbit coupling with the platinum on the top wants things to be perpendicular. So that's, a comp that's one competition. This is always stronger than that, or I, yeah, I think always. So this in general wins, but on, the long, on a longer length scale, this adds up and makes it want to make a, a, a curl structure. There's also dipole coupling, which also, by the way, wants to make it make a uh, some doesn't care chiral, but it does want it not to be all just up because there's a lot of dipole energy in that. So the size is all these different energies competing with each other. So there are skirmions that are tiny. There are literally skirmions that are like, oh gosh, like two nanometers, 20 angstroms, just, you know, like, like 20 atoms across. So there are little tiny skirmions, and then there are great big skirmions. And in fact, Anybody who has heard of the bubble, old-fashioned bubble memories, which were prevalent back in the 70s or 60s even, they're big. They're like a micron, and they can be skirmions too. Um, so the size, and, and in the end, the size greatly matters because that has to do with how much they pin and whether you can move them. And um, in G one of the competing technologies with these skirmions, well, let me say it the other way around. With current technology, you write your bits and then you spin the disk. So the bit doesn't move. The bit stays where the bit is and you just access it by spinning the disk and have a little weed head that spins over the top of it. In some of these skirmion technologies, you wouldn't have a spinning disk. You would actually move the skirmion. 
Um, and that is, that's very much like the old bubble technologies, where the idea is you move the material state, you, know, the mater you don't have a spinning disk, the material just sits there, but you move the object, the, 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 mag the magnetic bit moves. Um, so, now I don't know if this is, you know, there are a lot of people who are pretty skeptical that skirmions are sort of the latest, hottest thing and whether they'll actually, with, you know, bubble technology came and went um, without ever really becoming in everybody's computers, so I don't know. But they're, they're, they're sort of beautiful. I mean, they're also these sort of exotic objects and they're topologically protected, so then how do you, how do you make something that is topologically protected? How do you get rid of it? The very idea that you're gonna create bits, zeros and ones, that are something that in theory you can't ever create or destroy is sort of an interesting, <laughs> an interesting idea. Of course, nothing, you know, in the real world, none of these are, they're not perfectly protected, of course. Can I ask one more question? Yes, certainly. So your Carolinian dope is in Brazil and was very interesting. And I wonder if you have a theory or model that explains, you know, what's causing the, the transition of that, that, you know, from the insulating to... Yes, and actually that is one that I do have a, um, I should be careful. I have a, I can, so, the field of metal insulator physics is a competition between Coulomb effects, meaning literally the electrons ne negatively interacting with, you know, repelling each other, um, and localization effects. So the language I'm about to use is entirely the Anderson localization language. So in that framework, what I imagine is that the gadoliniums, I'm going to start in zero field, they're, so the gadoliniums are all pointing in all different directions. And there is every F electron, as an S, S electron, which are the carriers, the F electron interacts as an SF exchange interaction. And that creates an additional source of disorder. So as the electrons in the S, the S electrons which carry the current, travel, every time they run into a different direction, it's a, an additional form of disorder. If this were a simple metal, additional disorder would be a scattering center. So the mean free path would get shorter. And the mean free path getting shorter would make the resistivity, um, th would increase. Then when I, so I can do that part, so if I think in that model, now line those up, so the disorder goes, de decreases, I don't scatter as much, so the mean free path gets longer. So that would be a negative magnetoresistance. The problem with that model is none of these materials are in a limit where you can be talking about a mean free pass. They're all in this sort of um, this, this metal insulator transition where what's really going on is Anderson localization. So you have to do the, the Anderson localization with their different potentials. So it, it's not a scattering center in the sense of a mean free path. It's a scattering center in the sense of it's trying to localize the electrons. So with the gadoliniums all misaligned, the electrons are localized, and then as I line them up, they delocalize. So I can get a long way with that model, and in fact, I can even quantitatively get pretty far. The issue is, on top of that, as the electrons localize, they see each other more, meaning the Coulomb interactions get stronger, and the Coulomb interactions are many body effect. So the world, of trying to combine both the Anderson localization effects and these Coulomb effects is not one that anybody solved. So I can, whoops, I want to pass my plot. Um, so, oh, I've taken off. There's a very simple form for each of these. They have a t to the minus one half dependence, which is exactly what metal insulator physics has. So I can explain each one of those perfectly in metal insulator physics. What there is no theory is the way that t to the minus one half changes. And I can qualitatively say it's because I'm lining up the gadoliniums, but I can't quantitatively do anything with that. So it's, it's sort of a hand wavy Anderson localization. With each curve I can fit individually. I can collapse them all. I can make them, I literally can make them all collapse onto a single plot. But the, the collapsing variable has a, some dependence on how much these are lined up, which for which there is not a theory. No, we can keep going. 13% is just a really convenient one. It's, it's the sample I measured that had the largest magnetoresistance. So if I get more insulating, like less, like 12% or 11%, I can't measure them. They get to be so insulating that I can't measure them. 
And if I go up to higher percentages, that's where I actually go right through the metal insulator, but the magneto resistance is not as dramatic. So I've gone through the metal insulator, but the number is not as big. So it's sort of a trade-off of what I plot. But so there's nothing magic about 13. Thank you. Let's thank Dr. Helmut.